You're listening to As Read By Me, the podcast where writers read and readers listen. Welcome back, readers. I'm Dave Stiles, and I think we've got a pretty good show lined up. In today's episode, we have short stories from Jay Silber and Peter Waits, and a poem by our resident poet, Paul Camerata. Hello, my name is Jay Silber. This is Loretta Swit and me, as read by me. If you're not of a certain age, you won't remember that Loretta Swit played Hot Lips Houlihan on MASH. So if you're not of a certain age, go watch some episodes on YouTube and then come back and listen to this, because it's a fun tale for those of us who often struggle to maintain journalistic values in the face of management's idea of television news. In the summer of 1973, WCAU-TV's general manager invited the reporters to join the advertisers and a bunch of actors from MASH at a soiree complete with Lionel Hampton on xylophone, some speeches about how great the new TV season would be, and a pretty good dinner. And I have to admit, it was fun to sit at a table with people like Loretta Swit and the late William Christopher, who played Father Mulcahy on the show. CBS always had very strict policies about mixing news and sponsors. In fact, a few years earlier, when I was writing a story about how then-Philadelphia District Attorney Arlen Specter cited a number of supermarkets in the area with health code violations, a sales guy walked into the newsroom asking who was working on the story. I said I was, and he pointed out that one of the supermarket chains threatened to pull all their ads off the station if we ran the story. I introduced this salesman to our news director, Barry Nemkoff, who promptly alerted him to company policy prohibiting crossing the lines of news and sales. The sales guy complained to the general manager, but policy prevailed, and in fact, the sales guy was fired. Those times are long past in television news today. It seemed they were on the way out at the MASH dinner in 1973, too. It was one of the many reasons I ended my television journalism career in May of 1974. One of the key policies at CBS that resulted from the Chicago Democratic Convention riots in 1968 was a solid affirmation that as journalists, we must never, ever stage an event or direct people to perform in front of the camera. So the next day after the MASH dinner, when I was assigned to cover Loretta Switt's visit to the Army's Valley Forge Hospital, where wounded Vietnam vets were being treated, I had the policy slapped in my face. Ms. Switt, while an excellent actress, had no real idea how to behave with the wounded soldiers. She saw our news film camera and said, Tell me where you want me to stand and what to say. Uh, hmm, uh, but, uh, <laughs> I tried to explain CBS policy. But from her point of view, I was simply part of a promotional team. Well, I said, what would you normally do when visiting wounded soldiers? She looked a bit startled. I guess it wasn't something she normally did. So I finally explained all we could do was follow her, and she'd have to figure out what to do. She was not pleased, but ultimately did her best to greet some very grateful soldiers. I watched the constant self-promotion of programs and personalities on so-called news broadcasts today, and realized those policies we cherished in the early 1970s are no longer relevant. Really? The question that raises, of course, is this. Is local television news journalism? In a lot of cases, it's not. Hi, I'm Paul Camerata, and this is The Greatest Houdini, as read by me. Now to Niskeuna, New York, where last night into this morn, the great Harry Houdini has battled a baby Bjorn. He got into it easy, as he told the crowd he would, then buckled in a child, all the straps held like they should. Harry and the baby waved, onlookers cheered and cameras rolled. In back at rapid rates, great stacks of great Houdini t-shirts sold. Then a gong was struck, the lights were dimmed, the room grew still and Harry called out, now comes my escape. Can I, will I, why yes, I will. The great Houdini uninstalled the smiling babe with ease. As his assistant took the child, Harry bowed deep to his knees. 
That moment came last night at precisely 8.01 and was the most recent sign of the great Houdini's fun. Immediately after, the baby Bjorn struck back, its sneaky serpentining straps unleashing zero slack. Harry curved and twisted, disjointing his own ribs, until soon his expression looked like a baby stuck in a crib. He puckered and he wheezed as if battling quicksand. The Bjorn's grip just grew tighter with each move of Harry's hand. Late hours turned to early ones. The audience increased. Calls went out for scissors so Harry might be released. At present, local sheriffs are there on the scene debating if Houdini versus Bjorn, a public nuisance, is creating. It's been 12 hours now, and the harness shows no signs of, what's that? Wait, wait, stand by for an update? Why, why, yes. News flash now from Niskayuna up in New York State where an unexpected twist has changed the great Houdini's fate. As just before Harry succumbed to baby Bjorn's death grip, Mrs. Houdini onto the stage made a surprise trip. And with a giggle followed by a motion like a snap, she emancipated the great Houdini from his deadly trap. The crowd was gaping, weeping, laughing, speechless, stunned, and wowed. The baby Bjorn lay beaten while the great Mrs. Houdini bowed. Deeply to the knees, just like before Harry had done, placing on this death-defying night a memorable cap of fun. Hello, I'm Peter Waits, and this is We're Built Differently, as read by me. The forever popular comic strip Peanuts had interesting characters. Lucy was one of them, and she often had suggestions for the other characters. Her suggestions began, You know what you should do? A lot of the conversations between you-know-who and me start the same way. So sometimes I think, I am married to Lucy. This might be news to a few people, but male brains and female brains are different. I think the female brain is more efficient and processes information faster. At some time in our early years, we get excited when we notice that boys and girls are externally built differently. And for the sake of science and for the sake of pleasure, even though we are told the explanations are no-nos, we don't stop exploring. We enthusiastically want to physically study and investigate those differences. At our early age, we are so excited by the external differences, we don't spend any time thinking about the reality that internally we are probably built differently too. In particular, our brains are significantly different. And these differences result in boys and girls, men and women, sensing things differently and processing information differently too. As a little boy, I didn't know about this construct and I didn't know about this capability difference. Hell, even when I grew older, I didn't know these things and I only learned about them a few years ago. Now, since I'm around young boys and young girls on a regular basis, as I volunteer in our schools, I manage to bring these important brain difference facts to them so they, too, will have some basic understanding of what will be a strong influence in their confusing relationships. With this fact in mind, that our brains are put together differently, it is time to get underway. I'm off to a slow start this year. So far, life has been good and has been quiet, very quiet, but with the usual annoyances and inconsistencies. The result is, I please some people and I displease others, especially you-know-who. For example, you-know-who mentioned that our bathroom sink isn't draining as fast as it should. She asked me if I noticed it, and I said that I did. And thus the Lucy side of you-know-who appeared. You know what you should do? We have some gel to unclog the drain. Didn't you know that? Oh, yeah, I said. I knew that. I even know where it is. It's on the floor in the guest room closet. She looked quizzically at me. She started nodding her head back and forth. Then why didn't you get some and pour some into the sink to free it up? Yep, I had disappointed her. It was a good question. And my male answer didn't meet her high standards of who I should be. To put it mildly, my answer frustrated her. It can wait. Yes, the drain was draining slower, but it was still draining, so what was the hurry? I mean, why do today what can be postponed until some future tomorrow? Hell, at our age, we may be able to avoid doing anything about the slow drain forever, and the next homeowner, he or she will take care of it. 
Her answer to my answer, which I won't print because it caused me to frown, convinced me to get the gel, to get it from the closet, and to get started freeing up the slow draining problem. That was the audible exchange describing how our brains handled the situation. There was also a silent exchange when I thought to myself, hey, if you notice a slow draining problem, and you obviously did, then why'd you mention it to me? How come you didn't get the gel out of the closet and pour it into the sink yourself? On the same day that you know who caused me to frown, last Friday to be exact, earlier in the day another woman caused me to smile. My last class of the day, every day, is with Mrs. Pennypacker. Mrs. Pennypacker is a pleasant fifth grade, 50-ish attractive and available woman because she's a widow. When I showed up, she met me at the door, and she said she forgot to tell me yesterday that the Friday afternoon math class wasn't going to be held. To introduce the kids to a drug prevention program, the school has a dare member talk to them, and that is what was taking the place of the math class. I forgot to tell you about the dare program, she said. There's no math class today, but I want you to come back Monday. I really, really, really need you. No problem, I said. I was grinning. I was happy. She made my day. For a brief moment, a very brief moment, I thought about hugging her, but I didn't. Mrs. Pennypacker, it has been a long, long time since any woman told me she needed me, so thank you. You have made my day. She blushed and she laughed. I think I made her a day, too. Thanks for joining us. For more information about the podcast and the authors, visit asreadbyme.com. If you're a writer and would like to read one of your stories on an upcoming episode, send an email to writers at asreadbyme.com. If you like what we're doing and would like to help us remain ad-free, you can support us by visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com slash asreadbyme.com.